Vor genau 70 Jahren erschien in Frankreich ein Werk, das die moderne Welt erschütterte und veränderte. Sein Titel, das andere Geschlecht seiner Autorin Simone de Beauvoir. Über Leben und Werk dieser einflussreichsten Philosophin des 20. Jahrhunderts hat Kate Kirkpatrick nun eine neue bahnbrechende Biografie geschrieben. Zeit also, den Mythos Beauvoir noch einmal neu zu besichtigen und zu bewerten. Frau Kirkpatrick, herzlich willkommen in der Sternstunde. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Jetzt habe ich, wie das Journalisten so tun, ein Superlativ angewendet. Die einflussreichste Philosophin des 20. Jahrhunderts. Stimmt das für den Fall Beauvoir überhaupt? Well, that's a very difficult question, because I'm not sure what it means to be the most influential philosopher, um, I suppose, and how, how one would measure that. Um, but it's true that The Second Sex um, was an incredibly influential book, even within her lifetime, uh, passing the million copy mark by 1980. Uh, and it was translated into many languages around the globe and shapes and continues to shape uh, a lot of different feminist theory and activism. Um, so, but what I think that actually Beauvoir's influence uh, exceeds just the second sex. I think her philosophical writing and her life writing also have been incredibly um, influential in uh, the, sh the shaping of existentialism in France and also in uh, the way that her literature was received by uh, especially female readers. Wenn wir mal bei diesem Einfluss dieses Buches äh, bleiben, eine Million verkaufte Exemplare, eine weltweite Wirkung, mm. könnte man denn sagen, dass unser Art und Weise zu leben heute zwischen den Geschlechtern eine andere wäre, wenn es dieses Buch nicht gäbe? Yes, absolutely. I think um, th there are different ways of reading what Beauvoir was doing in the second sex. Uh, but however you read it, it was the kind of book that disturbed people. <laughs> and um, sometimes in the kind of way that they were happy to be disturbed, because it awoke them to a different way of seeing the world. Um, but also in ways that uh, provoked a lot of anger and wrath because she was criticizing um, the ways that men and women relate to each other in her culture and in ways that uh, not everyone was happy with. Diese Veränderung hat Widerstände hervorgerufen. Aber bevor wir zu denen wirklich kommen, es ist ja auch deswegen eine interessante Frage, die Frage nach der Philosophin Beauvoir, weil diese Frau fast ihr gesamtes Erwachsenenleben bestritten hat, eine Philosophin zu sein. Wie kommt das eigentlich? Well, so I think I'm She did deny in certain famous passages that she was a philosopher, and she said that Sartre was a philosopher where she was a literary writer. It's in one of her uh, memoirs, she made this claim. And it's perplexed a lot of feminists since, because, um, well, some have wondered whether this is internalized misogyny or whether she's excluding herself from philosophy. Internalisierte Misogynie heißt, dass sie ihre eigene Rolle als zweites Geschlecht angenommen hat und gesagt, ich kann gar nicht so gut denken uh, wie die Männer. Well, this is one way of looking at it, that yeah. philosophy is somehow for men and not for her. Uh, but I think that if you read uh, Beauvoir's work more widely, you see um, that she's committed to philosophy from very early in her life in quite profound ways. Um, if you watch documentaries about her life, um, like there's a documentary made by Jose Dayan, uh, and it introduces her as a philosopher. And she doesn't deny the title in a lot of places where we know she had editorial Uh, control over mm -hmm. how she was described. Um, so when she says that she's not a philosopher in relation to Sartre in the life writing, um, I think she, there's a way of reading it which sees it actually as an insult to the kind of philosophy that Sartre did. And we know that she distinguished between types of philosophy because in literature and metaphysics, one of her essays from the 1940s, mm. um, she distinguishes between what she calls systems philosophers and subjectivity philosophers. Und sie würde eher eine Subjektivitätsphilosophin sein als eine Systemphilosophin. Sie haben es ja gesagt, es gibt da einen großen anderen, einen großen Gleichen in Beauvoirs Leben, der etwas damit zu tun hat, dass sie sich zur Philosophie eher schüchtern äußerte. Mit diesen Menschen hat sie 50 Jahre ihr Lieben, ihr Leben, ihr Denken geteilt. Jean-Paul Sartre, wir sehen die beiden hier in einer ikonischen äh, Darstellung. Wie sinnvoll ist es eigentlich, Beauvoir als Philosophin von der Präsenz und dem Einfluss von Sartre zu trennen? How meaningful is it to distinguish the philosopher Beauvoir from Sartre? What a wonderful question. Um, so I think it's meaningful because the, they, they didn't think the same thing. Uh, and they, I mean, one of the reasons that I decided to write about Beauvoir in the form of a biography is because uh, doing that enabled me to look at the kinds of questions that preoccupied her philosophically. 
before she met Sartre. Mm. So we have new... In der Frühphase uh, ihres Denkens, kann man sagen. In the very early stage of her thinking, when she was a student in the 1920s, um, now, they met when she was very young. She was 21 at the time. But by that time, uh, she already had quite clear ideas about things like freedom and love, which she would later become famous for. Um, and I think in her later work, she stays faithful to a lot of the ideas she was developing very early on. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, it's meaningful to distinguish between the philosophies and Beauvoir and Sartre, because for much of Beauvoir's life, she was uh, subject to incredibly diminutive and dismissive um, reactions where people said that she owed everything in the second sex to Sartre's philosophy um, or that uh, she was a popularizer or someone who um, was very good at expressing the ideas that he came up with. And in fact, the documentary evidence doesn't really support that hypothesis. In ihrem Buch Becoming Beauvoir, das jetzt im April dann auch auf Deutsch unter dem Titel Simone de Beauvoir, ein modernes Leben erscheinen wird, Betonen Sie die Kontinuität in Beauvoirs Denkweg schon lange bevor sie Sartre traf. Aber man kann ja auch sagen, das war jetzt von mir schon so eine Frage, die komisch ist und andersherum nie gestellt wurde. Man fragt nie, wie kann man eigentlich Sartres Denken von Beauvoirs unterscheiden. Das heißt, es gibt eigentlich schon in der Wahrnehmung dieses Pärchens eine Art sexistische Verzerrung, kann man sagen. Ja, yes, absolut. There's this, this idea that um in, uh, I mean, I put it, as I put it in the introduction, um, they're famous for being an intellectual power couple, but the trope that seems to be repeated over and over again in the 20th century, and which she saw in her own lifetime, was that he was the intellectual power, and she was the part that made the couple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and she was a very good writer, uh, but, but people thought that uh, she, she was uh, lacking in imagination. This was an accusation that she faced frequently, whether she was writing philosophy or fiction. And... Um, One obituary, in fact, called her as imaginationless as her inkwell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is decidedly not the case. So if, if you look at her early thinking, um, you can see the continuity, as, as you said, but you can also see how her ideas shape Sartre's thinking. And I think that in the, the scholarly world, there is increasing recognition of this being the case. Um, a lot of writers in Simone de Beauvoir studies have been making this case for 30 years, but they've been making it on the pages of Simone de Beauvoir studies. So uh, es ist nicht richtig durchgedrungen in die Öffentlichkeit. Yeah. Eine wunderschöne Schlussfolgerung und auch eine problematische in Ihrem Buch lautet folgendermaßen ganz am Ende. Beauvoir war auch die Gefangene gesellschaftlicher Vorurteile. Ihr Leben ist ein Paradebeispiel für die Doppelstandards, denen Frauen unterworfen werden. Vor allem für die Art und Weise, in der Frauen abgestraft werden, wenn sie es wagen, die Wahrheit beim Namen zu nennen. Was sind denn sehr, sehr markante Beispiele für diesen Doppelstandard? Die Bewertung des Pärchens in ihrer Bedeutung ist eines. Kann man da noch mehr nennen, unter der sie gelitten hat bis heute, leidet? Yes, certainly. So I think one of the most prominent examples of that would be the, the behavior for which um, Beauvoir and Sartre became famous for being an open couple in the 1930s. Um, so they... Eine sexuell auch offene Beziehung. Yes, yes. So we would now call it polyamorous. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, there's a famous kind of romantic story of Sartre and Beauvoir that they, in 1929, they had this, um, this conversation outside the Carousel de Louvre. And... Um, where they said that they would be uh, necessary partners in each other's lives, but it was okay to have contingent partners on the side. And this has been inspiring to a lot of people because they think that you can combine a certain kind of romantic fidelity with freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, the consequences in the lives of some of their contingent partners were extremely negative. And in the 1930s especially, they had relationships with young women. Um, and. So what I, what I found interesting is that the asymmetry in the ways these relationships are uh, perceived and judged uh, in the case of Beauvoir and Sartre. So Beauvoir uh, had these relationships before she went on to write her ethics and to regret and condemn her mm. own behavior mm. and before she went on to write The Second Sex. Um, and in Sartre's case, we don't see signs of regret or uh, condemnation of the lack of ethics and, and his behavior in the same degree. Ja, da sieht man ja auch, wie die enge Verschaltung von Lebenserfahrung und Theorieentwicklung bei Beauvoir funktioniert. Das ist ja für den Existenzialismus ganz wichtig, den sie dann auch mitentwickelt. Das ist nicht nur eine Philosophie, das ist eine Art und Weise, das eigene Leben zu gestalten. 
Yes, absolutely. She wanted integrity between thinking and living. And there are times in life when she tried to live according to a certain conception of freedom or a certain conception of love, and then she found that it wasn't workable. And so I think that's one of the reasons it's very interesting to look at her life biographically, because she says that she, she wants her life to be consistent with her philosophy. And there are times at which she, she judges herself uh, unethical and requiring change and improvement. And so I think it's really interesting to chart that um, reflective process since we have access to diaries and letters where we can see it happening. In Ihrer Biografie legen Sie ja großen Wert auf diese Frühphase Ihres Denkens und auch auf die Phase von 1929 bis zum Ausbruch des Ersten Weltkrieges als die wirklich wichtigen Jahre Ihrer gedanklichen Entwicklung. Mhm. Und eine wichtige Phase ist das ja auch der sexuellen Befreiung, in der sich Beauvoir als Frau mhm. in, ihrer, in ihrem Begehren selbst entdeckt. Wie würden Sie sagen, ist in diesem Projekt der existenzialistischen Befreiung der Sex und die sexuelle Befreiung, welche Rolle spielt er da? Uh, in the project of existentialism. Und auch in der Idee, dass man sich selbst als Person entwirft. Yes, so I suppose the answer to that question depends on um, what point in time you're discussing. Uh, so there's a point in time where I think uh, Beauvoir judged her own behavior to be solipsistic. Wir sehen sie hier beide übrigens in dieser Frühphase 1929, wo sie sich gerade als Paar gefunden und kennengelernt haben. Ein bisschen ein ungleiches Paar sieht man gleich, aber auch sympathisch. Yes, yes. Um, the, um, yes, that's a very, that's a funny photo. They were at a fair. Um, and when you shot the gun, it took the photo. So her eyes obviously <laughs> shot at just the right moment. <laughs> um, also Sie, Sie sagten, das kommt auf die Phase an, in wie man diese sexuelle Befreiungsbewegung yes. Äh, sieht. Yes. So I think the, um, the, in Beauvoir's life, starting in 1929 is too late, because she had this very Catholic upbringing uh, and a particular kind of... Um, what's called in the Christian tradition, odium corporis, a hatred of the body, I think is, was something that she got partly from her mother and... Um, Auch vom Katholizismus als solchem. Uh. Yes, I don't think it's fair to paint Catholicism with a broad brush because it doesn't all uh, mm -hmm. fall under this category, but it's true that in her childhood, um, the body was something t t taboo. And so I think she, when she kind of emerged from this extremely uh, constricted childhood, um, into her life uh, with Sarge and, and on her own, um, there was a process of uh, rebellion and uh, self-assertion. Uh, and so it, so it played a very important role in her life uh, and in her, the development of her thinking. Um, but I would say that uh, the, the mature view that she goes on to develop in the 40s is that you can't just uh, think about sexuality as something that only relates to you because sexual relationships occur with other people and they need to be evaluated ethically on, on account of that. So. 1929, Sie sprachen es an, dieser Pakt zwischen beiden. Und da ist es ja sogar so, dass Sartre anbietet, sie zu heiraten. Und sie sagt, nein, ich will das nicht. Das würde uns beide unfrei machen. Ich will auch keine Kinder. Das ist ja eine Art Rollenmodell geworden als Idee, wie man eine Frau als Frau im 20. Jahrhundert eine Beziehung führt. Mhm. Und es passiert dann aber 1938, 1937 noch etwas anderes. Sie sprachen es an, äh, Beauvoir entdeckt ihre Bisexualität und geht einige Beziehungen ein, auch mhm. mit ehemaligen oder aktuellen Schülerinnen von ihr, denn mhm. sie war Gymnasiallehrerin zu der mhm. Zeit. Yes, so she did have relationships with both men and women, but, she, but as an existentialist, she's, uh, she thinks that sexuality is something that occurs in a situation between two particular individuals. So she wouldn't necessarily label herself bisexuality. Uh, sorry, by, she wouldn't label herself bisexual. However, uh, one of the interesting things about Beauvoir is that she, she said when she was asked later in life what she would do if she could have done something differently, she said that she would have given uh, an account of her own sexuality from a feminist point of view. Um, because I think that she recognized that there was confusion uh, in herself. Um, sie hat das ja auch nicht zugegeben, dass es auch lesbische Beziehungen in ihrem Leben gab. Sie hat das lange verneint und auch verhehlt. Yes, yeah, she did. Now, there, there are many possible reasons why she did that, um, including French law, um, because you, you, the, the loi de la vie privée uh, didn't exist in the, its current form, but you couldn't just write in your memoirs about your sexual relationships with other people uh, without con concerns for their privacy. Um, so I think 
there are many reasons why she may have concealed those relationships. Sie haben ja etwas Wunderbares gesagt. Ich glaube, darauf sollten wir eingehen, weil es ja hier nicht darum geht, schmutzige Wäsche zu waschen, sondern darum, dass diese Erfahrungen ja. für Sie philosophisch eine große Bedeutung hatten. Insbesondere in die Frage, was hat meine eigene Freiheit mit den Freiheiten anderer zu tun? Und yes. es gab ja da eine Erfahrung oder einige Erfahrungen, die ein bisschen problematisch sind seit heutiger, in heutiger Sicht. Mm -hmm. Es war nämlich so, dass Beauvoir Beziehungen zu Schülerinnen von ihr aufnahm und diese Schülerinnen dann, sollen wir sagen, weitergab an Sartre als Geliebte. Sie sagen, sind ein bisschen wohlwollend, würde ich sagen. Sie sagen, man weiß nicht so richtig, was sie gedacht hat. Und sie sagen, es war nicht illegal, es war konsensuell. Aber heute in der Zeit von MeToo würde man sagen, da haben zwei ältere Machtpersonen, jüngere Frauen sexuell ausgenutzt. So I would disagree with the claim that I was sympathetic to her, um, because uh, I'm not uh, with those particular actions. However, um, I do think that there's a tendency to, uh, in contemporary culture, to look on the past with the moral uh, judgments of the present, or even the moral judgments of a particular context. Um, so. Um, I also think that you know, my philosophy of biography is that it's not the biographer's job to judge the subject. Mm -hmm. It's the biographer's job to set out um, the documentary evidence that we have of what happened and to let the reader judge for themselves. Um, so I think um, in this, it was a very different context. And I'm more interested in the fact that Beauvoir condemned her own behavior. Now, mm -hmm. the, the language that you use, though, was by Sartre nie sieht, um, übrigens. What, No, so it never did. And yeah. also, but also the, the language of, that you used just there of handing on doesn't really fit the nature of the case. Mm -hmm. So uh, they viewed these women as, um, as individuals who are capable of making their own decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, so th the conception of freedom mm -hmm. that they had at the time was that they were free to make the decisions um, and uh, to sleep with each other or with other people. And so, yes, my, my personal view is that, the, that it was a very problematic dynamic. Um, but from the point of view of the philosophy, um, what's interesting is that uh, Beauvoir thinks there's a kind of solipsism in the way that they mm -hmm. interacted with those women, which mm -hmm. was just self-interested. Solipsism is in der philosophischen Tradition die Frage, ob andere Menschen überhaupt so existieren und so wichtig sind, wie ich es für mich bin. Yes, so this, it's this question of how much does the, the, the experience of the other person matter in my deliberations about what to do. Uh, and by her own judgment, uh, the experience of, of those women were not taken uh, with the, the right moral weight. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think um, you see these relationships actually written into passages of the second sex, where she's talking about the dynamics of unequal love. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not the case that the second sex was informed only by her hetero heterosexual experiences, um, but she had the experience of um, yeah, decidedly non-reciprocal love with some of these students, and her ethical reflections on them shaped Uh, the writing of that book too. In der systematischen Entwicklung des Existenzialismus als Strömung ist das ja eine ganz, ganz wichtige Schnittstelle, die de Boer erkannt und mm. ausgearbeitet hat, nämlich meine Freiheit, mein Entwurf, mein Ergreifen meiner yeah. selbst und die Wirkungen auf andere und die Bedeutung des anderen für mm. diesen Entwurf. Und das beginnt so in dieser 1938, 39er Phase aufgrund von persönlichen zwischenmenschlichen Erfahrungen, man noch gar nicht politische Erfahrungen, sondern wirklich Leben, Privatlebens. Angelegenheiten. It's, I think it's a mix. So she's, and I would say that in terms of the dating, um, in her student diaries, the Cahiers de Jeunesse, uh, as early as 1926, you start to get discussions of reciprocity and love, mm -hmm. and how reciprocity is lacking in a lot of the relationships that she sees. Um, and I think this is very significant because uh, in the late 1940s, Sartre introduces a concept of um, positive reciprocity mm -hmm. in his notebooks for an ethics. Positive Wechselseitigkeit, könnte man sagen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so uh, Beauvoir is already thinking about this in the 1920s. And then um, in the 1930s, she's you know, living a lot and writing less. <laughs> um, And so it's true that in terms of documentary evidence, it comes out again towards the end of the 1930s and the 40s. But I think it's very difficult to disentangle all of the elements of experience that can lead you to, um, to reflect differently on the way you've lived. Aber was ist denn eigentlich jetzt im Kern gefasst das philosophische Problem? Ich habe Vorstellungen davon, wie ich mein Leben führen will. Die anderen haben andere Vorstellungen. 
wie kommt der Gedanke, der dann für Beauvoir so wichtig wird? Meine Freiheit kann nur wirklich Freiheit sein, wenn ich die gleiche Freiheit für andere auch ermögliche. Wie, wie, wie ist das systematisch zu verstehen als Gedankenentwicklung? How is it to be understood systematically? Well, I suppose one way of looking at it is to say that after Nietzsche, um, when you have the revaluation of values and the question of how we're going to, if we can even, found an ethics in the absence of God or the transcendent uh, by some other name, um, Beauvoir thinks the answer is freedom. And so freedom is the, is the foundation of other values. And she thinks that if you value your own freedom, you to be consistent, need to value the freedom of others. Now, practically speaking, how that works out is not clear. Um, because freedom seemed to lead people to radically different conclusions. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and I think in her later essays, she starts to look at, it, she starts to think more about uh, politics and, and history. Uh, but to go back to the 1930s and, and the early 1940s, clearly the situation of um, the war and occupied Paris uh, was something that led her to realize her own complicity in, in, um, in history with a capital H. Hm. Um, so I think Man kann ja sagen, dass diese Besetzung Paris für sie eine Art politisches Erwachen war. Dann erst begreift sie, sie ist schon 30 Jahre alt, schon älter, dass sie auch ein politisches Subjekt ist, dass sie nicht nur ihr Privatleben hat, sondern eingebunden ist in einen viel größeren Zusammenhang. Yes, I think there is there is an awakening there. I think um, yes, and I mean one of the claims that's often made against Beauvoir, which I think is unjust if you know her life um, as a whole, is that she's apolitical. And I think this is this is partly because of what she herself wrote in her memoirs, where she gives this idea that Sartre comes back from being a prisoner of war, and he's. He's a transformed man. Uh, before the war, they had both been living in their minds, thinking about literature and Liberty. philosophy. Um, and, and then he comes back and, uh, you know, there's all this uh, decision about whether to be in the, the French Communist Party or, you know, all of these kinds of questions start to, to take much more uh, prominence in their lives. Um, but she was political. Um, it's just that her politics often centered on women, children, and the elderly, or in the 1950s, on Algerians. Uh, so she was, her, her politics was including groups of people who are often marginalized uh, and uh, not necessarily the kinds of, uh, the, the kinds of politicians uh, that Sartre was arguing with. Hör ich da so eine Art Wahrnehmungskritik heraus, dass wenn eine Frau sich für Kinder, für Frauenrechte einsetzt, dass man das nicht als ein politisches Engagement wahrnimmt, sondern irgendetwas, was auch schön ist, aber nicht wirklich die großen Fragen berührt? Uh, yes, I think in the 20th century that was certainly a widely held view. And I mean, if you look at her later works, for example, the, um, uh, her book on old age, which is a wonderful book that was published in 1970, um, she says there, because she's become more Marxist by that point in her career, um, that the problem with children and the elderly is that they are not yet or no longer men. Um, so this, there's this idea that the, the economically productive man is the subject of politics. There's this normativity. Um, also, im Prinzip, Politik ist Politik, die die Bedürfnisse und Fähigkeiten eines weißen Mannes bespricht. Und alles andere ist vielleicht wichtig, aber nicht sehr wichtig. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the, it's, the, it's a caricature, I realize. Um, but, but if you look at the way her work was received, uh, she was far from apolitical. And I mean, even the way that, that her literature was received, um, I think shows the way that women's concerns were marginalized and belittled. Mm. Um, so for example, in uh, her collection of short stories, A Woman Destroyed, um, when it came out, it's, it's a collection of three novellas, all written from women's points of views. And the reviews frequently said, why are there no men in this book? Was man bei Männer Literatur nie fragen würde, natürlich. Exactly. <laughs> Yes. Es ist ja auch interessant, diese mythischen Jahre, sagen wir 43, 44, Paris ist befreit, mm -hmm. Sartre kommt zurück, die großen Jahre des Existenzialismus. Für Beauvoir sind es auch Jahre eines Wandels. Sie schreibt eigentlich Kurzgeschichten, sie schreibt einen Roman und dann passiert was, sie wird selbst zu einer Art systematischen Philosophin, die die Frage nach dem Anderen und der Freiheit des Anderen ins Zentrum stellt. Und Sie ist nicht einig mit Sartre. Sie streiten darüber. Eine große Streitfrage, Sie erwähnen das auch in Ihrem Buch, ist zum Beispiel, wie frei kann eine Frau in einem Harem sein? Sartre würde sagen, da gibt es immer noch viel Entscheidungsfreiheit. Und Beauvoir, in dieser Situation gibt es keine Freiheit. Und wir sollten auch nicht so reden. Mm. 
Yes, well, so she, she disagrees about the concept of freedom. Um, and in Pyrrhus and Sinius, which is a book published the year after Sartre published Being in Nothingness, um, she uh, criticizes his concept of freedom explicitly and says that you need to keep a contrast like Descartes has between freedom and power. Mm -hmm. Because while we all have the metaphysical freedom of uh, being human, um, we don't all have the concrete power uh, that gives us uh, concrete possibilities to in pursue a in a situation. Yes. Um, so this criticism she articulates there, and I think um, she also uses fiction in really interesting ways to pose the problem in, uh, in situations of a fictional kind. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so she has this criticism of the concept of freedom quite early in the 1940s. And um, it's amazing how productive she was in the period from 1943 until the end of that decade. I mean, she was very productive generally, but that period in particular is incredibly intense. Um, and she uh, goes on then to write uh, essays about existentialism. They found Les Temps Modernes uh, mm -hmm. together. Das ist die Zeitschrift, die erscheint unter der Herausgabe von, von Sartre und Beauvoir. Yes. Und Sie machen den Punkt, und ich glaube, das ist ein Punkt, der sehr wichtig ist, auch in der Nacherzählung. Eigentlich ist es Sie, die mit Ihrem Gedankengut Sartre überhaupt zu einer Philosophie der Ethik befähigt. Yes. Um, so I think the... I think there's a, there's a constant conversation. One of their colleagues uh, or f from the 1930s referred to their relationship as a relationship of constant conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were philosophers, so that meant disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, I think they really did push each other to consider things um, in, in different lights. Uh, they were critics of, critics of each other's work, but Sartre, um, didn't ever publish his ethics during his lifetime. So the, the work we know now is the Cahier pour une morale. Mm -hmm. uh, is das ist ein Notizbuch, in dem er das erstmal yes, entwickelt. Yes, the notebook for an ethics. It yeah. uh, was written in 47 and 48. And a lot of the content um, there resembles things that Beauvoir wrote in this book, Pyrrhus and Sinius, but also in the ethics of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of shared um, commitments by the later 1940s. Mm -hmm. But how they went about uh, considering those people uh, who lacked power um, on account of being considered other uh, was different. So Sartre had, had applied his mind to questions like this in um, Anti-Semite and Jew and in Black Orpheus, mm -hmm. looking at anti-Semitism and uh, racism. And um, Beauvoir uh, then, of course, goes on in 1949 to publish The Second Sex. Um, and they, I think they're, theoretically, Sartre does not give an account uh, uh, that is as per persuasive to me of uh, the way that oppression features and accrues over time in the lives of oppressed people. Sie sagten, dass 1949, nach dreijähriger Arbeit, mm. intensiver Arbeit, erscheint dieses Werk, Le Deuxième Sex, auf Deutsch das andere Geschlecht. Und systematisch kann man sagen, die Frage nach dem anderen wird auf die strukturelle Frage nach der Rolle der Frau angewendet. Und es kommt heraus, dass die Frau nicht nur ein anderes Geschlecht ist, sondern ein unterbewertetes, strukturell in ihrer Bewertung als menschliches Wesen immer zweitrangig. Deswegen das Dösium Sex, das Zweite. Das ist der Kern der Diagnose. Frauen sind in gewisser Weise Menschen zweiter Wahl, wie Männer, nur nicht ganz so gut. Ja. Yes, yes. So uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting the, the way that the title is translated into other languages um, because Beauvoir takes pains to say um, that it's not just a matter of being other. Um, she, she says um, that uh, there are données physiologiques uh, mm -hmm. that, that make difference. Körperliche Gegebenheiten. But, yeah. uh, yes, there are bodily differences between men and women. Uh, it's a matter of being a subordinated other. And so she says uh, at one point in the first volume, um, it, it's a, the, the investigation for her is uh, what humanity has made of the human female. Um, because she thinks that, uh, there's, that there are ideas of um, becoming yourself and becoming free and... Um, Ein Entwicklungsideal, kann man sagen, für jedes Individuum. An, yes, an ideal of development, of pursuing projects, of living a meaningful human life uh, that are uh, presented to men in ways that are very different to the kinds of lives that are presented to women as their destiny, to use one of the words that Beauvoir uh, herself uses. Um, 
And so one of the claims that I think is very interesting and not necessarily entirely out of date <laughs> is that um, she says that for, for women, uh, they are told that their destiny is to love. Um, and she says that love is the woman's supreme vocation and that to the extent that she succeeds at things other than love, for example, if she has projects for her life because she has a career or she wants to uh, write or she doesn't want to conform to certain kinds of um, traditional expectations of, in 1949, marriage and motherhood or mm. being someone's mistress, um, then you're perceived as a failure. So she thinks that to, to succeed as a woman is to succeed at a certain kind of being a loving person. Und das hat immer damit zu tun, dass man sich in gewisser Weise um andere kümmert. Das heißt, ein Leben yes. im Spiegel und in der Widmung an, zu anderen Menschen. Und sobald yeah. das nicht geschieht, ist man als Frau in irgendeiner Form insuffizient. Yes, absolutely. You, you, you are there. She, she says in the book, uh, and she's playing with some jargon, existentialist jargon, um, uh, that uh, in, in existentialism, you know, they distinguish between being for yourself, being for itself, which is consciousness, and being for others, which is the way we are seen from a third person point of view. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and she says that women are encouraged to be for men. Um, and she doesn't just mean visually or sexually, she also means that their lives are meant to be built around supporting the projects of the people that they love. And she discusses people like Nietzsche and Tolstoy praising this ideal, this admirable ideal of the woman whose life is lived in a sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. And she says, if this is such a wonderful destiny, then why don't men want it too? <laughs> so. Sie haben ja gerade gesagt, die Beschreibung der Frau als in gewisser Weise das Art von menschlichem Wesen, das sich anderen widmet, andere kümmert, andere betreut. Das ist ja heute im Feminismus auch ein aktuelles Thema, wenn man zum Beispiel den Care-Begriff nennt, wie man sich um andere kümmert. Und viele Feministinnen sagen, wir brauchen eine höhere Bewertung dieses Aspektes der Zuwendung zu anderen. Dann kann man sagen, einerseits versteht man das, andererseits fällt man doch da genau in das Beschreibungsmuster hinein, das Beauvoir freilegt. Well, so I, I think this is a really interesting question, of course, one that divides feminists today. Um, some people think that you can look at relationships between, to, to just take heterosexual uh, relationships for now, uh, as a relationship in which there's a giver and a taker, and that is usually divided along gendered lines where the, the man is the taker and the woman is the giver. But that, I, I find this very dissatisfying um, because we aren't just, we don't just exist in relationships uh, like heterosexual sexual relationships. Uh, we might have elders who need care or children who need care or friends who need care. And um, so I think that uh, looking at this relationship outside the context of other relationships seems to me a problematic way mm. of going about it. So mm. reduzierte um, Sichtweise. Yes, and I think one of the things that, that Beauvoir is sometimes caricatured as saying that um, the answer is not to give at all, but that's not what she says. The answer is to expect reciprocity. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want an, if you want an ethics of, um, if you want ethical relationships, if we stick to intimate partner relationships for now, um, the answer is not to stop giving. The answer is to, to have a relationship where both partners pursue the projects of the other person and help them in becoming who they want to be mm. um, in, this, in this kind of vision that she has of becoming a self. Um, and, yeah. Es ist ja interessant, diese, diese Wechselseitigkeit als Ideal, das hat ja dann eine gewisse Karriere gemacht im 20. Mm. Jahrhundert. Man kann aber auch sagen, in ihrer eigenen Beziehung zu Sartre hat sie sich trotzdem eigentlich immer in die Rolle des Kümmernden begeben, während bei Sartre so viel Kümmern nicht immer zu sehen war. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things, give, uh, given that she was influential in the development of the concept of bad faith, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, reading her biography or reading her own descriptions of her life, one is tempted to think uh, that she was in bad faith about it at different points. Um, now, again, I refer you to my previous point mm -hmm. about not the biographer's job not being to judge. Yeah. Uh, but I think... Um, Aber das legen Sie schon auch klar frei, yeah. dass es da eine Spannung gibt. <laughs> yes. Einer dieser zentralen Sätze und viele große Bücher haben es an sich, dass sie auf einen Satz zusammengeschmolzen werden können. Der ist bei das andere Geschlecht, bei Bouvoir an sich. Man wird nicht als Frau geboren, man wird zu ihr gemacht. Was genau ist die Kraft und die Wirkung dieses Satzes für Sie? Well, so I read that sentence in the context of... Um the second sex as a whole, mm -hmm. but also French conversations about freedom. 
Uh, and so it occurs on the, the first page of the second volume of the second sex. Es kam zuerst in zwei um, Bänden, muss man sagen. Auf Deutsch liegt es in einem Band yes. vor. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. It was published in, uh, in two volumes. And in the first volume, uh, she, it, it was called Facts and Myths. And she looked at the ways that uh, women have been defined uh, from the point of view of historical materialism, psychoanalysis, biology, and literature. And she says, this is the vision that we have of woman from the point of view of some men. So she's not generalizing, she's not universalizing. Uh, it's a very culturally located text. If you read the literature sections, it's got mm. discussions of uh, Stendhal and uh, Modelon and Claudel. It's auch ganz schön langweilig zu lesen, nicht? Das geht da 20 Seiten so yes. Literaturanalysen. Yes. Uh, Yeah, so if you were if you if if you were at the in in the center of the literati in the 1940s, you would be reading these people with great interest. Um, <laughs> but but it is like I said, a very culturally located text. But she picks out um, the vision of woman in in these different approaches um, because she wants to know what humanity has made of the human female. And then in the second volume, which was entitled Lived Experience, she looks at what it's like to become a woman in a culture where these are the expectations of you, because she says there are a lot of contradictory myths of women, and that's one of the things that makes it difficult to be a woman. Also eine zentrale Einsicht ist, dass die Frau nicht das Wesen hat, das naturell vorgegeben werde, sondern dass es unsere Erzählungen darüber sind, was es eine Frau ausmachen soll, die die Frau in ihrem Freiheitsraum einschränkt. Yes, that's that's one reading. It's a very popular um, Anglophone reading. Um, so one of the things that's quite commonly said about the second sex is that Beauvoir distinguishes between sex and gender. Mm -hmm. uh, she doesn't use the word gender because in French, uh, gendre is a it's a you know linguistic term. Um, man muss man sagen noch mal zur Erklärung: Sex ist das biologische Geschlecht und Gender ist die kulturelle Konstruktion, yes. die mit dem Frausein einhergeht. Yes. So there, so there are different readings of, of Beauvoir uh, since the second sex was published. Um, and and uh, so they will often take that, some readers take that line to mean uh, that one can become a woman irrespective of what sex one is. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that Beauvoir does as a literary writer is that she often uses antiphrasis and she'll take famous texts from French philosophy or French literature and uh, change a word or two in a subversive way. Sie liest das gegen den Strich, sagt man auf Deutsch. Ja. Yes. And so uh, there was a philosopher of uh, freedom and determinism who was uh, quite prominent in, in France in the late 19th century, Alfred Fouillet, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote several books on freedom as an idée force. So it's, uh, he thought that freedom was a, a, an idea that was um, particularly powerful because the desire for freedom had the power to override other desires. Da, darf ich mal kurz nachfragen, weil diese Idee der Freiheit der Wahl, mhm. die Existenzialisten sagen ja auch dieser wunderbare Satz, die Existenz geht der Essenz voraus. Nichts ist bestimmt, ich wähle die Art und Weise, wie und wer ich bin. Das hat ja dann im Feminismus des 20. und 21. Jahrhunderts eine ziemliche Karriere gemacht, sodass man wirklich sagte, und einige Feministen haben das gesagt, die Art und Weise, wie ich mich selbst geschlechtlich verstehe, ist vollkommen meine Wahl. Es gibt da gar keine biologische Grundierung. Das ist aber nicht das, und das ist auch nicht der Standpunkt von Bova. Das heißt, sie sagt, es gibt eine biologische Grundlage, die ist wichtig, und dieses Ideal der ganz freien, quasi luftleeren Wahl meiner geschlechtlichen Identität, das, das, das geht zu weit. Well, so, yes, so my, I, I agree with that characterization, because in the French text, she talks about les données physiologiques, mm -hmm. uh, and she, she says, I mean, large passages of the second volume discuss um, things like, Uh, menstruation and pregnancy and physiological processes and possibilities that pertain to a particular sex. Um, so, you know, th she was writing in 1949, uh, but she also, I think, was quite explicit about wanting to chart a middle way between nominalism and essentialism. Also, die Art und Weise, dass man alles tun könnte und die Art und Weise, dass es da Gegebenheiten gibt, die nicht zu überbrücken sind. Yes. Yes. And so uh, to go back to the Alfred Fouillet point, he said in his philosophy of freedom, uh, one, is, one is not born, but rather becomes free. So he, in French, gave exactly, on ne n'est pas libre, on le devient. Mm -hmm. So that is the sentence. It's, it's a word you find in other contexts referring to Spinoza, who's, mm -hmm. I, who I think is also very influential for Beauvoir. Um, and the, uh, 
so I think that she's, in, in, if you read The Second Sex in view of her ethical writings in the 1940s, where she's, she's keen to develop um, a philosophy that can be lived and that takes into account um, what it means to, uh, to become an ethical self. She's, she thinks that there are particular challenges facing women in becoming ethical selves because they're, they're given these ideals of womanhood um, which often uh, exclude them from the kinds of possibilities uh, that they would like to pursue. Und die auch mit körperlichen Gegebenheiten zu tun haben, die Sie auch genannt haben. Wie groß dieses Projekt einer Befreiung der Frau für Beauvoir eigentlich gedacht wurde, schauen wir uns mal im Original an. Da legt sie das nämlich kurz nach der Veröffentlichung in aller Breite dar. Toujours l'émancipation de la femme a été liée à l'émancipation sociale. Quand en Amérique, il y a eu un grand mouvement contre le, la ségrégation au 19e siècle, du même coup, il y a eu un grand mouvement féministe. Les deux se soutenaient. Eh bien, si, si la femme est dépolitisée, elle dépolitise l'homme. C'est très sensible en France parce qu'elle le garde lui aussi à la maison, on regarde ensemble la télévision. Et de cette manière-là, en empêchant la femme de se politiser, on empêche aussi l'homme d'être politisé. Et on empêche la femme d'être politisée si on l'empêche de travailler. Parce que la vraie politique, c'est pas le bulletin de vote, qui, le bulletin de vote qui sert au contraire à maintenir la dépolitisation. Parce qu'on votera pour, mettons, le pouvoir personnel. C'est la participation à des syndicats, à des groupes de pression. C'est par le travail seulement, par la vie économique, qu'un individu peut s'intégrer à la vie sociale. Alors on maintient la femme loin de la vie économique, à la maison, donc on la maintient loin de la vie politique. Si vous voulez, je crois que c'est une des raisons très fortes pour lesquelles il y a tout ce mouvement contre äh, l'émancipation féminine. Wir sehen hier Beauvoir schon in einer späteren Phase. Sie und Sartre sind politisch globale Aktivisten geworden, haben sich zum Sozialismus, zum Marxismus teilweise bekannt. Und hier hat man das Gefühl, das geht eigentlich nur mit einer umfassenden Weltrevolution. Und sie fängt an mit der Befreiung der Frau. Also ein, ein unglaubliches, umfassendes politisches Projekt wird daraus. Yes. Um, so a lot happens between the 1940s uh, and the, 19, the late 1960s. Um, and one of the things that I find fascinating and very inspiring, uh, having done the research for this biography, is that uh, after writing The Second Sex, Beauvoir received a lot of letters from women. 20.000 habe ich gelesen. Uh, mehr yes, als 20.000. Yes, so in, yes, so in the BNF, there, there are uh, over 20.000 letters that she received. But they, um, they shift considerably. So there's a wonderful... Um, a uh, researcher who's looking at the letters at the moment, Marine Ruche, and um, I think, so we know that after the second sex, she received letters from readers saying that this book is too important to be written in a thousand pages of alienating philosophical prose. Mm -hmm. um, and why didn't you write it for the people who needed it? Uh, and in the, over the course of the 1950s, partly on account of what was happening uh, with Algeria, uh, and partly on account... In Algeria, muss man sagen, hat ein Unabhängigkeitskampf stattgefunden. Frankreich war die Kolonie, sehr blutig, uh, sehr schlimm. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, indeed. Um, so Beauvoir was um, uh, active in France in uh, the cause for Algerian independence. Um, and uh, she in the mid-1950s, wrote a, a series of essays uh, which were published under the title uh, Privilege, or Privilege. Um, and one of them is about how um, the privileged can think their situation. Mm -hmm. And she's very critical of intellectuals uh, for thinking about ideas and thinking about the meaning of life and writing about it in such a way uh, that only their cohort of uh, similarly educated book buying uh, <laughs> Uh, people will so eine Milieublindheit, die man eben entwickelt. Man sieht nicht die Privilegien, die einem ermöglichen, der zu sein, der man ist. Yes, absolutely. And so, um, so I think it's very interesting that it's at that period that she turns to the project of writing her own life. Mm. And so when she published Memoirs of the Dutiful Daughter in 1958, it was published with a little notice in French, which said that um, she wanted to apply the theory of the second sex to her own becoming a woman. Also praktisch eine Selbstuntersuchung ihres eigenen Werdeganges im Lichte ihrer Philosophie. Das ist ja ein sehr spannendes yes. Projekt. Und deswegen mm -hmm. sind ja auch diese Biografien keine richtigen Biografien, sondern eher typologische Ex Erklärungen, was es heißt, eine Frau im 20. Jahrhundert zu sein. Absolutely. An ihrem eigenen Beispiel. Yes. 
so in literary terms, you can read this in the history of Bildungsroman. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is the building of a woman. Um, she became herself, and she says explicitly that she's going to do it without the theory of psychoanalysis or the, the jargon of philosophy. And it's after the publication of that that readers return to the second sex in great numbers. Um, and it's after this that she starts to receive uh, a different kind of letter from women, where they say, um, you've descended from a pedestal. And uh, I didn't think you could be like me because of what you've achieved, but actually you've described so many things that are similar. Aber das hört man ja heute auch im feministischen Diskurs äh, auch oft. Sie werden das oft hören als feministische äh, Philosophin. Sie sind eine weiße Frau aus England. Sie können ja gar nicht wissen, was uns Frauen in Mexiko und Venezuela im Kongo wirklich betrifft, weil sie diese Erfahrungen nicht haben. Ist das denn eigentlich ein gutes philosophisches Argument? Well, so I, I don't think it's an argument in the in the letters well, for these women, <laughs> because the uh, I think uh, we're we're all divided from each other's experience to a certain extent. Um, but what I think is interesting about these letters from Beauvoir's readers is that they started to tell her about their situations. They started to tell her. Um, you know, that they'd done all the, the things they were expected to do. They've, they'd married the nice man and had their three children and they felt empty inside. Um, and so in that clip that uh, you've just shown, she talks about the, the women being at home and segregated and lonely at home. Mm -hmm. And so she's, she, her eyes were opened to the lives of uh, many Françaises ordinaires. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think then she becomes politically galvanized once she once she uh, sort of sees the world from this different point mm. of view and mm. she gets involved with uh, different French liberation movements. Of, yeah. Es ist ja auch interessant an dieser Sequenz, die wir gezeigt haben, dass sie so eine starke Trennung macht zwischen dem öffentlichen Leben auf der Straße und dem privaten Leben. Ja. Und das Argument ist, die Privatisierung der Frau heißt, sie zu entpolitisieren. Das könnte man sagen, heute halten ja. es viele Frauen für eine politische Aktion, ein Hashtag zu Hause weiterzusenden. Das heißt, diese ganze Konstellation ist ja gar nicht mehr so die gleiche mit dieser Trennung zwischen öffentlich und privat. No, it's not the same. Uh, I think a lot has changed, and so we may find her analysis dated in that respect. Um, but the, uh, I think that, you know, in, in fact, her own thinking helped if bring about these changes mm -hmm. about how political the personal life is and why why care isn't valued why it's only the economically remunerative work um, that is uh, valued uh, by society and yeah haben Sie das Gefühl, dass bei Beauvoir der Fall und das wäre ja ein sehr produktiver Fall einer Denkerin, die die Grundlagen dafür gelegt hat, über sich selbst hinauszudenken. Das heißt, dass sie heute nicht mehr aktuell ist, aber dass es eine Wirkung ihres Denkens ist, dass das nicht der Fall ist. Um, so, I think there are some passages of the second sex that I think are current today. Other passages, I Zum think. Beispiel, was würden Sie sagen, ist besonders wichtig? Well, so her analysis of um, the of the myths of love, the contradictory myths of love. We may not be reading Stendhal and uh, Claudel uh, in the Netflix. same quantity, <laughs> but we have Netflix. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we have, we have new tropes that I think reinforce problematic messages. So for example, uh, in film you often have, uh, films and television, you often have very intelligent, successful women. Um, but it's frequently the case that the, the minor plot is that their personal life is in disarray. Uh, so the idea that you could have a woman who is both uh, pursuing her projects in life outside of romantic life or maternal life um, and loving other people in a way that she finds uh, meaningful uh, still seems to me, um, well, I, I, don't, I don't often find people that I admire on both fronts. <laughs> Maybe that's a fault in me. But also, yes. diese, diese Beschreibung des Mythos der weiblichen Liebe, der ist sehr aktuell. Was würden Sie denn sagen, das können wir nicht mehr brauchen, das ist einfach in seiner Zeit situiert, aber das ist vorbei? So, I suppose... Um, in terms of the currency of the, the first half, uh, the, you know, even within Beauvoir's lifetime, she said that she would have given more focus to the material conditions of women than she did in the first volume of The Second Sex. I think that the biography section, uh, sorry, not the biography, the biology mm -hmm. section um, is um, in some respects out of date. Uh, but I think uh, when she talks about uh, the independent woman, um, and when she talks about the sexual objectification of women, which is a, a major feature of her account of uh, the, the oppression of women. Sie hat wach dafür gemacht, was das bedeutet, im Blick des anderen zum Objekt zu werden. Yes, she, 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 she did. She, well, so I think um, she made us alert to it. But what I find fascinating is that despite being a woman who went on to campaign that pornography should be illegal, 
uh, and that um, that sexist slurs against women should be illegal because slurs against um, Jews and black people mm -hmm. are. Uh, she's still remembered by many as a kind of sexual libertine on the basis of a behavior in the 1930s instead of as a feminist who thought that women would be freer to become themselves if they became themselves in a society without so much sexual objectification. Da gibt es ein Zitat ganz am Ende dieses Buches, das mir sehr kraftvoll schien und das ich Ihnen noch mal gerne vorlesen wollte. Da schreibt sie nämlich, dass den das Ideal eines Liebesaktes des freien Austausches, in der sich Mann und auch Frau in ihren sexuellen Bedürfnissen als ebenbürtig erkennen. Und dann kommt ein Satz, der mir sehr zu denken gegeben hat. Zitat, doch paradoxerweise fällt es der Frau viel schwerer als dem Mann, ein Individuum des anderen Geschlechts als ebenbürtig anzukennen. Es wird sie, als ob sie sagen würde, die Männer schaffen das vielleicht, aber die Frauen aus dieser Beschreibung der Frau heraus, die schaffen das nicht. Das ist eine komische Analyse. Also, ne, da stolpert man drüber. So I, I, let me make sure that I've understood. So do you think that women generalize about men? Sie, sie schreibt, dass es für die Frau als Frau schwerer ist, einen Mann als Individuum anzuerkennen, als andersherum. Am Ende dieses Buches. Yes. It's, um, well, she can't be right about everything. <laughs> I think uh, it's, uh, to the extent that she generalizes about men and women, she sometimes goes wrong. Like, I, I think one, one of my criticisms of the second sex would be that uh, the scope of her sentences is sometimes too broad. Now, some women may struggle with that, but not all women. Um, just like some men uh, engage in morally problematic behavior, but not all men. Um, so the, um, I think, I, I don't know. On, I, I suppose to kind of do, to, to kind of take a charitable approach to that sentence. My understanding of what she's saying is that if you are conditioned uh, 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 because of your childhood as a woman to think that your destiny and the meaning of your life depend on being loved by someone, mm. then a man can become an instrument of achieving that destiny. Ah. And that's unethical too. Ah. So her ethical criticism uh, in the second sex is not directed exclusively at men. She thinks that there are certain perks for women in identifying with the kinds of myths that exist. Um, uh, because uh, what, one of the criticisms she makes is that um, Unlike other oppressed groups, women don't say we um, because they identify with the class of the, the men to whom they're attached often. Ja, wunderbar. Ja. Jetzt habe ich das verstanden. Das war für mich wirklich jetzt ein, ein wichtiger Erkenntnisfortschritt. Wir haben dieses, diese Sendung die Befreite genannt, weil Beauvoir jemand war, der die Muster ihrer eigenen Unterdrückung erkannt hat teilweise gebrochen hat und teilweise sich davon auch gelöst hat. Trotzdem würde man sagen, dass die Befreite ein guter Titel ist. Anders gefragt, hat Beauvoir es wirklich geschafft, die Systematiken, die sie selbst zur Frau und damit zur Unterdrückten machten, vollkommen von sich zu weisen, insbesondere auch in ihrer Beziehung zu Sartre? Oh, so that's a very interesting question. So, so it, the, that final chapter in German is called The Liberated Woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in French it's La Femme Indépendante. Mm. Uh, so it's Die about... unabhängige Frau. <laughs> yeah, yes. ganz um, anders. So, um, so I think she thinks that there's a certain kind of independence that's ethical, or maybe, we, maybe the best way of putting it is to say that it's a precondition for ethical dependence, because relationships require a kind of dependence on the other. There's a vulnerability involved. Um, but in order to give yourself ethically, um, she thinks that you need to achieve this kind of independence, um, which, which means that you're not instrumentalizing. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the, the question about Sartre, so my, my view is that their relationship was an intellectual one. And as I say in the book, um, it's a myth that it was uh, romantic in any conventional sense uh, after 10 years. And she was deeply dissatisfied with it um, in the period when it was romantic for reasons that I go into. Mm -hmm. um, but they still had um, an incredible intellectual relationship. And, um, das ja auch eine Form von Liebe ist, sich in dieser Weise yes, einander yes. zuwenden zu können. Yeah, and I think one of the things um, that, uh, uh, you know, I refer you to my previous point about yeah. ju forming judgments about uh, her relationship with Sartre. There's a lot that I find uh, 
um, problematic. Um, but I think it's undeniable that they encouraged each other. And I think that the, way this, the ways that they encouraged each other in their projects is part of the reason that they're so inspiring to so many. Und das ist ja nach wie vor eines der großen mythischen intellektuellen Paare des 20. Jahrhunderts, vielleicht die große philosophische Liebe des 20. Jahrhunderts. Wenn Sie jetzt Studentin haben oder vielleicht auch eine Tochter, was wäre denn der eine Satz und der eine Gedanke, wo Sie sagen, das möchte ich weitergeben, das scheint mir sehr wichtig an dieser Frau? Um, well, one of the words that frequent, one of the sentences uh, that she herself penned, which I think uh, does a very good job of um, presenting the tensions between the public life of a woman and the personal life of a woman, uh, of her stature, is that publicity disfigures those who fall into its hands. So she is, Simone de Beauvoir is a legend. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir is sometimes a kind of feminist icon. Uh, the book, The Second Sex, is an icon. Uh, and, and, and people haven't always read it when they cite it, uh, it as, as a kind of authority in their arguments. So I think um, that publicity disfigures those who fall into its hands. Wir haben hier jetzt selbst ein öffentliches, ein Public-Gespräch geführt. Ich bin ganz sicher, es hat uns nicht zu sehr verstellt, sondern hat vieles freigelegt über diese wichtige Frau und ihr Werk und auch ihr wundervolles Buch. Vielen Dank, dass Sie heute da waren, Frau Kirkpatrick. Thank you.